All right, Johnny Max in the house here on the Sports Bash Live 97.3 ESPN. He appears via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, like all guests of the show. This week, teams chasing the Eagles. We've got the AFC and NFC South. We will dive into two teams every day during the week and get uh, John's take on the teams chasing the Eagles here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. What's going on, Johnny? Something happened yesterday. Did you catch it? Uh, I don't know what you could be talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that wasn't going to happen. But God bless, God bless people if they thought there was a chance. Well, the the some people have questioned, like there's been this circle of like, that it's a failure that the the Sixers were not able to get LeBron James. Like you covered the NBA for a while. The fact that the Sixers even got a meeting and were in the conversation, doesn't that kind of like stand for something of where they are as a franchise? No, I, I don't think it either way. It, it reflects on much because most people in that league were aware for a relatively long time that if LeBron was going to be leaving Cleveland, it would be for the Lakers this time. So uh, I, I don't think if people are trying to go back and re-legislate the process, and I'll remind people again, the guy's been gone for over two years. Move on. But this particular player is not a part of that because he didn't want to go anywhere else. And, and it had more to do with Brand, with his future in life and his ability to be in Hollywood and do some of the things that he wants to do post-NBA career more than finding the best basketball situation. Right. And then, you know, you had mentioned, I saw you tweet out that, that you didn't think that um... – that LeBron used the Sixers or that they were ever early in it. They just kind of got a courtesy meeting. That's a lot to, to fly across the country just for a courtesy meeting, don't you think? Well, from the Sixers' perspective, remember there's a there's a public relations aspect to it too, and they want to make sure that they are doing all everything they can to get potentially the greatest basketball player of all time. I, I think that was what they were trying to accomplish and trying to signal to their fan base, look, we're trying to do everything possible to win a championship. Uh, from from the LeBron's camp, it, it was, you know, he met with Magic Johnson on Saturday night, Brian Windhorst, and nobody's been closer to him, said he made his decision last week, which is, what I heard from various NBA people. But until you sign the deal, until you agree to the deal, you can always change your mind. So if that's 1%, a half of 1%, you know, why not try? Mm -hmm. So I think that's what was going on from the Sixers' perspective. John, I saw you also retweeted that uh, the tweet about the way he announced his destinations kind of uh, paints the picture of the evolution of how media has gone over the past decade. 2010, he had the Decision TV special. 2014, he had an essay on SI's website. And then by 2018, Instagram story. So what are we going to have in 2022? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully nothing. Uh, hopefully we won't have another one of these. But who knows? I, I, I mean, uh, he's got to slow down at some point. Uh, you would think four years he would no longer be the best player in the world. Uh, but I, I think this is his last stop for the reasons I said, because I, I think this has to do with his post-NBA career as much as it has to do with his current NBA career, and that's where he wanted to be. He already has a house that, out there. He's got tremendous respect for Magic Johnson. He wants to sort of duplicate what he's done in his life going from sports star to successful businessman. That's what he wants to do. And he also has a tremendous respect for, if you think about LeBron, he's a New York Yankees fan. He's a Dallas Cowboys fan. And he wants to play with the Lakers. He, 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 
when you talk about organizations like that, they have meaning to him. And, and that's why I say the Sixers, this is not a referendum on anything involving the 76ers. But he was a Carson Wentz fan, too, and that wasn't enough. <laughs> well, Mike kind of asked that question if Carson Wentz could get him to come here. I, I mean, it's probably more likely that LeBron could get Carson to come somewhere than vice versa. LeBron's, I love Carson. People in Philadelphia should love Carson. Yeah. But LeBron's kind of a bigger deal. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's. The, the, you know, just the notion, though, that, you know, because LeBron James basically said he wasn't going to Philly, he was going to L.A., you know, the, the fact that people now say, like, you know, you're a failure, I think, is to be is, is quite extreme. No, I, I don't think it has anything to do. Like I said, I don't think it has anything to do positive or negative with where the Sixers yeah. are, where they came from. I, I don't think this particular player was open-minded. And he wasn't looking for places other than that have meaning to him personally, which would be Northeast Ohio. Because you and I, we battled about this four years ago, right? I mean, we just did not see eye to eye on this. I think one of the questions I asked, like somebody who's on was on that side of the fence back then, uh. Has what has occurred from then to now may, maybe uh, changed your opinion or moved you at all? What in in reference to just about like okay, they obviously were not trying to win. Uh, some people would you know say purposely losing or tanking or whatever word you wanted to use that the culture was going to be awful that they were never going to like the fact that they were able to get a meeting with LeBron James like going back four years. If I sold you, hey, they're going to get a meeting with LeBron James in three years, just you wait, people would have been like, dude, they're not even getting J.J. Redick to sign here, let alone a guy like LeBron James. So I'm like, going back four years, you look back and say, you know what, there were some things that they could have done better, but maybe there were some things I didn't think were going to go as well as they have. Well, I said the Sixers were much farther along than I thought they would be at this point. But if you go back to that four years, like one of the one of the problems I have with the process people is the assumption that the non-process people don't understand what was going on. It's not brain surgery. If you lose enough and draft at the top of the draft, professional sports is cyclical. Eventually, you're going to get good. And if you're good, that's not necessarily true, though, John. I mean, there's teams that draft at the top of the draft perpetually, but they're terrible. Well, if you're drafting first or, or second every consecutive year, at some point you're going to get good. That's just the way it's set up. Sacramento's still waiting. Phoenix is still waiting. But you're, you're, you're pointing, again, they didn't go to the degree the Sixers did. And remember, what are the core pieces of, of this team right now? Well, and beat, two players, and beat correct? Uh, it beats him and Sarge, Fultz. I mean, yeah, they got they got two well, there's, there's top there's level two players. that are proven. Yeah, and there's a nice role player, but the two cornerstones. If we can't agree on the two cornerstones, I mean, then forget about anything. It's Simmons and it's Embiid, and we all know why they got both. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I think a lot of people during that time. You know, the look, I was a fan of going for Bynum just because they tried to do something. It was, hey, we're not just going to sit here well, and, and wait. Bynum works out, and I give you credit for that. Many people won't point out, you know, when we talk about irrelevancy, I know you like to throw that word out there. Sixers were incredibly relevant when that trade was made. Yes. People forget about it. It's revisionist history. This city was so excited. Yes. It didn't work out, though. No. But my point is, I'm not just a fan of the process. I was a fan of taking a chance at something different than sitting there waiting for the draft to come and hoping that pick 12 
turns into. But you just said yourself, they took that chance, and they did take that chance. Absolutely, it and I was a fan of them. Out. I was a fan of them taking that chance, and it not work. It didn't work out. So at that point, when that didn't work out, I said, "All right, you got to do something different because whatever you're doing now, it's not working." Well, whatever they're doing now is trading for perhaps the best center in basketball, and unfortunately, the the medical people cleared him. It didn't work out, and and it blew up in their face. Yeah. So it's fair to point that out, but to say they weren't trying to move forward the prior regime, and I always say as a West Virginia guy, you should be ashamed of yourself <laughs> to be criticizing a Hall of Famer for a guy who's been unemployed for over two years. That's on you, Mike Gill. <laughs> I said – I had dinner with Rod Thorne, and he personally told me that they did not think, you know, the the team that beat the Bulls in the playoffs was going to go any further. They knew that that well, team. Of course, and what did he, and what did they do? Right, they, they traded tried to get for the best center they in traded, basketball, and I applauded them for that. And when that blew up in their face, they went back to being what they were previous, a thirty-eight win team. And, uh, yeah, but you're, you're, you're pointing out the, the obviousness of the fact that you make a, a serious move. You make the move to try to get to that next level. It doesn't work out. Yeah. And then at that point, you kind of conflate every team since Allen Iverson and really going back to the Barkley era as being the same. It's just not true. You give me a memorable season from 12 to 84. Well, we, we other had than 01. On air with D Lionel. And, and, and both, and I remember both D and I were yelling at you. <laughs> you, you again, you're conflating interest in the process into interest in the team. And what D said is that Thad Young, Andre Iguodala, Drew Holiday, Lou Williams, whoever else, there were a lot of people in this town that liked basketball that were interested in that team. And and you're arguing they might have been interested in that team for they might have been interested in that team for a couple of weeks. They're not interested in that team year round like they are now. But the people but, but the people you're talking about aren't interested in this team. They're interested in proving Sam Hickey was right. Nah, That's I don't it. know about that. You don't buy tickets to a game and jerseys and and and, well, and I argue that they don't. I mean basketball fans do that. And you know Well then how do you I'm how would you quantify them being top 4? They're number 4 in the league well, in jersey I'll put sales. It this way. I live in Stratford, New Jersey, South Jersey. When the when the Phillies were making their run, you'd go out every weekend, and everybody in town had a Phillies jersey on, Phillies shirt, jersey, all this Phillies merchandise. You go out today on one of the hottest days of the year, you can't find a Phillies cap, a Phillies T-shirt, Anything, and it's a pretty good team. I agree with you on that. They're, however, what I'm trying to say is, except for the Eagles, it's and I'm talking Phillies, Sixers, Flyers, they're only relevant when they're good. That's it. I don't know, man. Uh, the engagement that I receive 24 tw- 7. Year round for a team that won ten games was. Well, what do you get, Mike? I see you arguing with the pro, with the anti process people. What are you getting? You're arguing about the process. That's what you're arguing about. That's what D and I were trying to explain. You're not arguing about the team or what they need to beat the Celtics. What they need to be. Take that next step. You're arguing about the same thing over and over again, which is the process and whether it worked or not. And that comes down to an individual person. But that's what I've tried to – that is the point that I make very often. It's, it is a 
each individual person and how they want to view things on what kind of result they want to get from the team they root for. Well, and that's the second part. Now, if you want to be fair, you have to admit that a lot of process people, I'm not saying you. Yeah. Oh, I agree. A lot of process people moved the goalposts, and they said it was about winning championships. Now it's not. And and on the other hand, there well, are I think there's a lot of I do agree with I agree with you. Knowledge. Yes. Who, who who will not acknowledge that the Sixers have gotten good players because of Sam Hinkie's plan. I agree. There it's both sides. And they're both wrong, but nobody's given any ground. Oh, I agree with that. Like you say, both sides, you know, I I was not one of those people that's like, hey, if you don't end up with multiple championships, you're a failure. You know, for me and what I do, the fact that people consume and engage and care about this product more than at any time in my life is – my father the other day says to me, okay, I love the summertime, but I am ready to give it up because I miss watching the Sixers. Well, that's fine. You're talking about a particular constituency. To, to say Philadelphia basketball fans care more about this team now than Allen Iverson or, or going back to the great teams uh, of Julius Irving and Moses Malone, that to me is silly. I said. Now, if you I said from 2012 to 2012 group, to 2000 to 1985, there's probably two or three seasons that were more anticipated or engaged than this past one. Well, I, I would just say that Charles Barkley was a bigger star than any player the Sixers have now. Now maybe they have potential. To surpass them. Nobody believed that Barkley's teams were going to win anything, yet. though. What's that? Nobody believed Barkley's teams were going to win anything. He was going up against Jordan and Bird. Well, nobody believes this team's going to win anything, but you claim there's interest in them. Yeah, and, I, and by the way, there is interest. But it, it is not at the level of what you're saying with, with from the basketball aspect. It, it's about it's about the process aspect of it. That basketball fans like basketball, and they like Drew Holiday, and they like Sad Young and Andre Iguodala, and they like Charles, and they like AI, and they like Joel Embiid, and they like Ben Simmons. But there is a group, there is a niche, niche that loves the process. Mm. And, John, as much as I've enjoyed the verbal ping-pong between you and Mike back and forth in this segment, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Kawhi Leonard and which side of the camp you fall in in that argument because I did see a tweet from you where it sounds like you're not into the package that there that is reportedly out there, that you think it's too pricey. Well, I don't think it's too pricey if you can get him to re-sign. I think the issue is getting him to re-sign. If you could promise me he was going to resign, I would drive those three first round picks. And Dario nobody Clark promised Oklahoma City that Paul George was going to resign. Well, yeah, but I, I mean that's like that's like saying the perfect storm hit, and so you're going to count on it hitting again next year. I, I mean because you say because Paul Paul George intimated he wanted to go back home at one point and changed his mind and assuming that's going to happen again. Mm. I, I I don't know if that's a great strategy. Uh, oh, now, I'll say if this. You can, if, you can, if you can get Kawhi in a room and he, he gives you some hope that if things go properly – I give up more than that. Yeah, but if it's going to be one and done, and you kind of know that, no, I, I'm not. I'm going to go in a different direction. Uh, I'll go. You know, and this is what I'll say real quick. Um, when all the people, you know, they talk about championships and they have to win championships, and that's all it. You know, for me, this was for me. I said to for me, forget calling it. Here's two things. One. If Hickey never came in and said, we're going to lose on purpose, 
There's morons out there that would have accepted that and just said they stunk. But because he actually told them, they despise it. That's number one. Number two, to me, it wasn't about all that. It was about rebooting the franchise and changing the culture from being a mediocre my, franchise. My question, my question to you is, the, why do you assume that somebody like me, who has covered this league for a long time, didn't understand that from the get-go? I'm not saying you, but you see what I deal with. <laughs> I, yeah, and, and like I said, but you can't. And it's the same thing. We see this in politics every day in this country because everybody's so polarized. You can't assume because one person doesn't understand that everybody on that side of the fence doesn't understand. Yeah. And it, 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 it comes down, same as I say. As well, a like my question, person, my question always admit, is, okay. You have to admit certain people have moved the goalposts. I ask the same question yeah, all the time. Not, I never get it. All. I ask the same question to these people all the time, I, and this is when they go silent. In 2012, they were bad. They didn't make the playoffs. That's when everybody got fired. They brought Hinky in. They were already bad. They were not a. It's not like they were a fifty-win team that he took well, I'm, over. I'm, they were horrible. I'm going to go West Virginia on you again. They, well, hold on. They were horrible. If, if so my you, question was: think. in 2013, when when they when he when they took over the, the new regime took over, was I? Because people say they threw away three seasons. Do anybody out there legitimately believe that those three seasons were going to amount to anything? Well, what was the definition to amount to anything? You tell me. Do you think that any of those three seasons were going to amount to anything that they quote unquote threw away that we missed out on something? If you're talking championships, obviously no. Then what did you? Then what did we miss out on? What did we throw away? Well, what do you, what did you miss? And let's do a 180. What do you have now? If championship is the only definition. I, you're not I well, I can tell you this. You go in the next okay, season, I can. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But I have a team that just won 52 games with three guys under 25. I haven't seen a 50 win season since Iverson was here in 01. Hey, I'm talking to a guy who destroyed the Atlanta Hawks for winning 60 games and the Toronto That's Raptors true. for winning 59. That's true. That you're absolutely right. Because now, you're not talking to some because fall on Twitter now. <laughs> because you're those have a tough time out. <laughs> me. Because those teams, in my opinion, anyway, didn't have. Yeah, a, but that, that's my point. In your opinion, sixty wins means nothing now, in Atlanta, but fifty-two means everything. And so no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. If that team had sixty wins and had a superstar player, that's different. If the Toronto Raptors won well, 50. Superstar? I, I just said before, John, there's win. three players in this league that can win the championship. Three. Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, and LeBron James. And if you don't have one of those three players on your team, you better figure whoa, something else whoa. out. What about Steph Curry? Steph's got one uh, uh, by himself before KD. That was a kind of a weak one with uh, no Kyrie, no love. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, hey, if you're gonna, if you're going to be – if that's your definition, you have to get three players. Yeah. One of three players. You can't get KD. You missed out on LeBron. Yep. So you better make that trade for Kawhi and yep. hope you win this year. Well, and, and that's why I said in three to in, here's my and then here's, you could be irrelevant uh, but, for the next twenty and, years. And here's what this is what I said before. In three to five years, when those guys are in their mid thirties and it's starting to change, you have to ask this question. Do you legitimately think that – now, Joel Embiid's played one full season. Three to five years from now, is he a player that could be the best player on the team that wins a championship? That's your question. And if the answer is no, well, then guess what? You're the Raptors. No, but it, it, I don't think he's that player. But I'll tell you why. It has nothing to do with Joel Embiid. It has to do with the NBA. And I've told you this time and time again. The linchpin of this team is not Joel Embiid, it's Ben Simmons. Well, it's Simmons and Embiid. Pick which guy you want to say. You pick which guy. If it's Embiid or Simmons, 
Is one of those two well, guys or two of them together three. good enough? Three to five years from now, are those two guys together good enough? And if the answer is no, then you got the Raptors. Well, it, 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 it all depends on Ben Simmons developing a jump shot. Yeah. <laughs> because the way NBA basketball is played today, a center, the days of Kareem and Will and Bill Russell – and those guys dominating, it's not the same game. And that guy can't be the centerpiece. All right, back with uh, more of that conversation. That was Maybe fun. Woo, that's good stuff. <laughs> Johnny Mack, you the man. We'll talk football tomorrow, pal. All right, buddy.